much time to find. Generally put it in my little iPad and my notes up here and that thing. And I'm half afraid of that because you know electronics, about the time you start trusting them, you hit a button and it all goes blank or you're in another program, you can't get it back. And that I knew I shouldn't have trusted that. They always tell you, if you do that, make sure you have a backup. So tonight I have paper in front of me as I'll try to follow them best I can. Listen, why people do not love this book, why people do not study this book, and I'm talking about the Bible, and why people don't read this book. You say, what are the reasons? We're going to look at six reasons tonight why people do not love this Bible. Now I know as Christians in here, and I know I'm speaking primarily to the choir you, uh, per se, and we, we love the Bible, but there are reasons you'll find why Christians do not. And they'll have every excuse under the sun. About the time you think you know all of them in the excuse book. Uh, because, look, I grew up in church. Most of you grew up in church. I grew up with a pastor as a, as a father. And uh, so coming to three or four or five services a night, that's not, I mean, I don't even think about it. You just, that's what you do. It's like brushing your teeth or going to the bathroom. That's what you do. And you enjoy it. You love it. You live for it. So I know how the snow blows on this thing, but you hear all these excuses down through the years and people and Christians have them primarily going to preach to myself tonight. <laughs> the, the guy catching the mirror, this is to me, I fall under this caption, but there are reasons why people do not love study and read this book. Look, you're going to have to do all three or have all three down if you're going to be a successful Christian. Now, if you want to be a dropout Christian or a lazy or part-time Christian, well, we, we got a few minutes here and then we'll get out and we can drive home and watch the news and then go to bed. But tonight, if you're interested in it, take your Bibles. Hopefully you have them with you tonight. John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20 are my verses I want to spring from. I'm going to go straight from there to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, and then Hebrews chapter 9 to get some context. But uh, in John chapter 3, John chapter 3, and I'm, I'll, I'm going to stick with this. Here, if that'll work for you guys, will that work, this, this one here? Okay, thumbs up, let's move on. John chapter 3, if you found your place, verse 19, it says, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Verse 20, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, the, uh, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Let me pray real quick, and then we'll get to our first, first point here. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we bow before you again. Thank you for this time. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And Father, be with your folks that have come out. Be with those that wanted to be here that are not present. Father, we pray for them. Lift those up that we prayed for that were sick, that needed uh, praying, praying for. Uh, be with those, uh, Father, that are out and uh, should be here that are not here. And Father, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters that aren't able to get out tonight. And Father, we uh, ask that you be with the message, be with the hearts. Again, we ask that you would suit a blessing to those that are in need. Uh, and Father, encourage the saints. We ask you tonight. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, man says he doesn't have much time. I've, I've caught myself, I've even said to myself, I just don't have much time to get to that. Well, he has time to read the newspaper, and uh, he has time to watch TV. I find I have plenty of time for that, uh, and read magazines. And the time it would take to read it, the average magazine, uh, we could read the New Testament through one time. One time. Uh, you could study it a few times if you if you were studying a word study or something like that. But we squander a lot of our time. Why is it that people won't read or love or study the word of God? Well, the first one we find we've looked at John chapter three, verse 19 and 20. It says, because our deeds are evil. And uh, it says, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And one of the first things you're going to find is it strengthens their conscience. It strengthens our conscience when we read and when we study the Word of God. But if you find, turn with me to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. I love this verse, one of my favorite verses. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Move forward with me to chapter 9, 
of Hebrews, and we're going to look at this conscience. We're stating, number one, that it strengthens their conscience. That's why men do not want to study or read the Bible. You say, why do they want their conscience weak or they don't want it strong? Well, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And that's a question, by the way. Listen, uh, the Bible strengthens your conscience. If you have a strong conscience, spiritual conscience, that means you're able to cast the pull down the, the imaginations that cast themselves against the knowledge of God in your life, then you're going to want to get up off uh, of your seat and do something for God. But you'll find that Men don't want their conscience strengthened, especially from the Word of God. This is why they don't study. This is why they don't love and read the Word of God. A man wants a weak conscience so he can do what he wants to do. Uh, science and scholars and psychiatrists and psychologists have led men astray. Man says, if I live by my conscience, I will be all right. Uh, man says, if I follow my conscience, I will be fine. You'll find this philosophy a lot uh, even in the Christian circle. The Bible says their mind and conscience is defiled. That's what we just read. It's defiled. A conscience that's not a witness or witness to or test to or by the Holy Spirit. That means controlled or run by the Holy Spirit is an unreliable conscience. Conscience alone is not reliable guide. Conscience is has to be led by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. That's why men do not read, love, or study the Word of God. And I could add Christians, <laughs> because we're speaking to Christians tonight. I don't know where you're at, but we're going to go on. Take your Bibles and turn with me again to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. The excuses, I would listen to them, and the older I get... They go in one ear and out the other. I look at the actions and actually what is produced. And uh, I can say that now. I'll be 42 this year, I guess. But when he's younger, you're like, well, this guy said he could do this. Or this guy said, or this person said they're going to do that. And then they don't do it. It's not, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't turn out the way they said it was going to turn out. Or, or it's not what they said it was. You see, what's wrong with that? Our conscience is defiled. There's more liars than there are true speakers today. And it's sad that Christians, us Christians, have fallen into that trap, into that trap. So a second reason why men doesn't study or read or love this Bible, 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, notice with me in verse number 6. He says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you, that he may exalt you in due time. Uh, now, suppose uh, you were an evolutionist or, or an atheist or an agnostic. You wouldn't want to read the Bible. You wouldn't want nothing to do with the Bible. And uh, so you're not going to say, well, I love the Bible, but then believe this. You don't want nothing to do with, with the Bible. Uh, the Bible shocks a proud person. A proud person don't want nothing to do with the authority of Scriptures. Doesn't want nothing to do with the doctrine of the Scriptures. They don't love it, and they don't want to read it. They don't want nothing to do with it. But the Bible says that a man is getting morally and spiritually worse. A proud man doesn't want to hear that. Uh, the world and the world's philosophy and their all educated bunch doesn't want, they don't, they don't want to hear that. That man is getting worse. And uh, we as Christians are only a few steps behind the world. And because when you preach on the world, you get that look like, what is he talking about? Uh, well, you know that. It's not, I haven't heard any amens yet. You know, you know you're hitting close. We're a step or two behind the world and how we live our lives. And uh, you say, well, what, what is wrong with people? They don't love this book. They don't read this book. They don't study this Bible. The Bible is one of the great levelers of all people. Uh, you, you can learn a lot about somebody when you bring up the Bible. We can talk all day about work, but when you bring up a verse of Scripture or something about the Bible, it gets quiet. You know, right where that person's at. Kind of quiet, don't want to know nothing about the Bible, prayer, and I'll just keep it hush. You can talk, well, some people can talk about politics, other people can't, but you'll get an argument going. But when you bring religion up, when you bring the Bible up, it gets quiet. You get that look like, are we going there? You know, that look like, what do I do? What do I say? 
at the, you see why? It's because the Bible is the leveler of all people. Proud people don't read the Bible. They don't love the Bible. It wounds their pride, according to this scripture right here in 1 Peter chapter 5. Man says, I don't read the Bible because there's a lot of nonsense in it. And uh, that man has a lot of nonsense in his head. That's what's going on there. And a lot of men do. So let's move on. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at another verse here and another reason. Another reason, a God biblical reason why men do not love or study this Bible. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And it's a shame. You hear, I've heard all kinds of things. Oh, uh, well, uh, you know, I don't do this. I don't read the Bible. I don't do that. Or I don't love the Bible. Or I don't study the Bible. Well, I read it, but I don't study it. And you say, how long have you been saved? Well, I, I've been saved. You know, if they say I've been saved about a year or two years, okay. I understand that. When they start saying, I, I was saved when I was a kid 20 years and 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you're like, man, what is wrong? What is wrong? Are they even saved? And then about that time, you start praying for them. But you often wonder, and the questions raised, why are they there? What's going on? What's going on? Why does everything fall apart for them? Well, it's because the book, the Bible. Where do they stand with the Bible? You can tell a lot about a person where they stand with the Bible. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 10 with me. And it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Listen, it exalts Jesus Christ. That's why men don't love the Bible. That's why men don't read it and study it. It's because it exalts Jesus Christ and it doesn't exalt self. Men have, have society. We have our society, our culture. Uh, we have our denominations. Uh, we have our clubs. We have our lodges. Uh, we have our committees. We have our institutions and our, inst and our seminaries and in our country. Some people will put country above God. Well... And it's always generally elevated above Jesus Christ. But the Bible elevates the name of Jesus above every name that is named in heaven and on earth. But we find even in the Christian world, the Christian and just Christians, uh, you and I, us, that we have other things put up instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, why doesn't men study the Bible, read the Bible, love this word? It's because it exalts Jesus Christ and not self. It destroys self. And you see people who use self all the way through the Bible, and you see God deal with them, judge them, chastise them, and yet even still love them. But you see that self is not exalted in the Bible. Jesus Christ is exalted. And that's why, that's why men don't like it. That's why the world doesn't like it, because it exalts Jesus Christ. It's funny, you find it funny, you find a man named Paul before or Saul before he was before he was converted. And uh, he was getting letters from the chief priest to kill Christians. And the whole thing about that, when you study that, it was they were preaching. It wasn't the preaching necessarily, but it was the name that they preached in, Jesus Christ. They did not want uh, th those folks to preach in the name of Jesus Christ as being the Son of God. When you exalt Jesus Christ, that's when it separates them. You can have an inner faith, outer faith, uh, denominational little service. But when you bring Jesus Christ above all other gods, you got a problem. See, the world wants to level it. Muhammad, uh, whoever, whoever, whatever God you want to pull, Buddha, Confucius. Uh, and, and you have these in the, or Allah. That's the neutral one for today. He's still the moon God, no matter how which way you put it. Uh, but they want to level it. Well, Jesus Christ is above every name. All authority, all power, all judgment has been given to Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ is exalted. Man don't want nothing to do with it. And most Christians don't either. They want self. They want things. They want ideals. They want entertainment, if you please. Tickle my ears, tickle my toes. And so it goes. So uh, we see that, thirdly, that it exalts Jesus Christ. That's why men aren't quite lovers or studiers of the word of God. Fourthly, we see something else here. Go back to John chapter 16. We were in John chapter 3. That's where we started. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Notice with me in verse 8. It says, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness 
and of judgment. We see it disturbs the routine of godlessness. And I kind of took this point from another preacher. It disturbs a routine of godlessness. If you have a godless routine, that means, uh, let's see, you get up, you go about your morning, you go about your day, you go all the way through your day, and God's not even in it. No praying, no reading, no studying. It disturbs a godless routine. Most Christians stop right there. If it's going to interrupt my routine, we'll pass. I'll catch it when I get to church. Uh, Sunday morning, uh, maybe Sunday night, if they don't preach on me too hard Sunday morning, everything is working out okay, no games in, in the middle, then we land on Sunday night. Wednesday night you're here, well, I wish, well, you wish everybody was here, but you guys are getting it tonight. It disturbs the routine of godlessness. John chapter 16 and verse 8, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Man says, I don't need to read or love or study the Bible. Uh, it'll cause you to lose your mind. What did uh, King Agrippa say to, to Paul? He says, much, much study and hath made thee mad. And so he was trying to coin him or pair him as somebody who, was, who wasn't right in the head. That's what the world will call you if you stand up or love or say you love the book. And I don't mean in a stupid way. Oh, you always, uh, I don't mean, the, the word is correct. There's a lot of stupid people out there. And so they'll cloak this, they'll use this, and you'll say, man, what is going on? Some of my first uh, remembrances of seeing some of those men was preaching on the street. And we go down there and preach on the street as a little boy. We were talking about this the other evening, Mrs. Maggie and I, remembering years gone by. And so some of those guys would, I don't know if there was, I don't know what was up with them, but they'd be jump on a newsstand box back then i guess i don't think they still have those boxes they put the newspapers in jump up on that hollering and screaming i knew the guy and i didn't know what he was saying he was screaming so loud you're like what happened to him and i my first thing was is he hurt is something wrong with him and you know you would think he would have something wrong with him and i remember asking dad is he okay dad said hey hey you there was couple different kinds of people you're going to find in life and then the older you get you kind of realize the guy something was wrong with him I classify that as being stupid. They're zealous, but they have a stupidity with them. There's a fine line between that. I'm not speaking of that. I'm speaking to have a genuine love in your heart that doesn't matter where you're at, who you're with, whether you're by yourself and you love the word, you need the word, you know you need a drink, you know you need to taste, because that's what gets you through this dark, this dark day. So it disturbs the routine of godlessness. That's why men uh, do not love the word of God. And we see, fifthly, let me quote this one to you. It's in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 9. It says, The shoe of this countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Christians fall right in that category when we live our life away from the Word of God. We fall in that, and we reward, we're rewarded of evil unto ourselves. You find in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 5, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20 says this. He says, uh, rebuke them in the sin. He speaks of a, re of a, of a rebuke in there. Let me run over there. I'm going to butcher that. I thought I would be able to quote it, but from memory, and I, it's not coming to me. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 20. He says this. He says, uh, them that sin... And he's speaking in the context of church. I know this is a pastoral epistle, and uh, he's in the context of a church. But he says, them that sin, speaking of, you want to know what that sin is? Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, hinny of sins, not, not, uh, not your sin that a lot of people think, oh, this is sin. And listen, he says, them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. There's a sin that you can get caught up in that causes the church or the body of Christ to be punished because of that sin left undone, noticed and known. And here he's saying, look, this is not good. It exposes sin is what I'm saying. Point number five is it exposes sin. That's why men, that's why you and I, even as Christians sometimes don't like to read or study the Bible. It exposes our sin. And uh, here he's saying, look, you need, it needs to be rebuked. Uh, some of these sin, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you had fornication in that, that church, a known sin. It wasn't like it was kept secret, it was known. And nobody was doing nothing about it. And he said, look, you got to get this out of the church because it's going to cause everybody else to be a part of that sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says that fornication is one of the only sins that causes the flesh, the body, to sin against your own body. 
So it's not a light sin. This is not what, what, what we're describing here in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 10, verse 20, I mean. Run over to the next chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Notice with me in verse 11. Here's where it goes. Well, you shouldn't say nothing about that. Notice this. Same epistle, same writer, same context. Verse 11, 1 Timothy chapter 4. By the way, the teaching and the preaching that's going on here is in this type of position uh, that has been going on. These things, these things, what things? The things that we're reading about, uh, the things that have been taught. Uh, I think we're studying 1 Timothy chapter 3 on Sunday morning. These things command and teach. These things command and teach. You say they, they're to be taught and they're commanded. And you say, well, it's not iffy or question, questionable. That's because it exposes sin. It exposes sin. Men who live in sin have always, have always hated men who exposed sin. I've seen that. I've seen that. I got quite ways to live. God, God allows us to tarry. But men who sin have always hated the men who have exposed sin. Uh, they call them negative. They call them a preacher of discord. They call them a preacher of hatred. Uh, they say the preaching of the gospel of doom, not of good and glad tidings. Listen, it's all because it exposes sin. And when the Bible exposes sin, it's to be gotten right. It's not to be thought or reasoned out. It's to be immediately turned from, repented of, and gotten right. And if not, it leads to more sinning. It doesn't get better. It gets worse. That's why it should be turned from. A godless men whose lives are cloaked in garments of self-righteousness always hated an expose of sin, the preaching, the expounding on sin. I have found that people who are most concerned about racial and social issues are the least concerned about their individual sin in their own individual lives. And that's true. That is true. Uh, what about them? Well, we need to do this over here. What about your life? What about the sin that needs to be got in your life? Let's get that right. Uh, what does the Bible say? Take the beam out of your own eye. All right. And then let, lastly, let's look at another one. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. We're on the roll. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. See, why don't men study or love the Bible? Why is there such a just a just no zeal, nothing there? Well, we're looking at six good reasons why men don't. And I say men loosely, I mean the term as whoever is involved or counts themselves as a Christian or anybody in that group. Men and women, boys and girls, seniors included. All right, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Yes, I was at school all day. You can tell. <laughs> Miss Becky and I. We uh, was on our tour list to do. We enjoyed it. We had school. And so uh, we're fired up for this evening. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Now, we have actually been studying here in schools, chapel. We've been on a series of lists, a series, uh, a lesson. And uh, we've been looking at four and five. But we're going to look. Notice with me, verse five. And notice what he says here. He said, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I just can't control what I'm thinking. Liar, unless you're lost. Um, I just, it just those urges. Uh, if you're a Christian, you have the power. You're not allowing the Holy Spirit to run your life. You're still in the driver's seat. You're still on the mountaintop as running the show. You got you to get that changed before God can move in and do a work. But you have the power, according to Scripture, you are able to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and you're able to bring it into captivity, every thought, to the obedience of Christ. And lastly, lastly, it demands obedience. I think it's one of the most important things about the Bible. Why men do not like studying it, don't love it, or don't love to read it, is because it demands obedience. And that's what that verse is talking about. 2 Corinthians, look there, chapter 2. Notice with me here, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 9. He says, for to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. The Apostle Paul, by the power of the Holy Spirit, doesn't leave wiggle room. People say, well, there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. There's a whole lot more commandments and laws in the New Testament under grace than there ever was under the law. 
I didn't know that. That's what we're talking about. That's why we're saying men don't love the word of God. Men don't like to read the word of God because it demands obedience. More obedience than they ever thought about. Uh, listen, Romans chapter 6. Let's nail this down and then we'll finish. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Notice with me in verses 16. The Bible says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether ye be a sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Listen. It demands obedience, and it depends on which one you're going to yield to. And you say, well, how often does that happen? That happens on a minute-by-minute, hour-by-hour, daily basis. So I thought it was just Sunday to Sunday. It's every waking minute that you live as a Christian. There's a battle going on. There's a battle going on. Uh, the, things to do, uh, the thing to do is to throw caution to the wind and read your Bible. So I don't know how to read. Learn how to read. So I don't want to read. Train yourself. Discipline yourself to read. There's days, I'm going to tell you, there's days when I haven't read the Bible. And it's a miserable day. Until we, maybe the end, I'll grab a verse. There's, ver there's times when you get up and you're able to only to grab a portion of a verse or a chapter. Uh, maybe, a, maybe a portion of a Proverbs. Whatever you read. But read the Bible. Take it in. But not only read it. Study it. You need to study it. The studying brings that love for the Bible. If you say, I don't have a love for the Bible, then you don't study the Bible. The, 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 the Bible will lend its love to you that you fall in love with it when you begin to study it. Not just read it, but, but study it. Listen, I want to challenge you tonight, if you haven't noticed, to step up, get up, and to do more. And that's one of the areas that you and I can do more. We can read, we can love, and we can study the Bible more. Because the day isn't getting brighter. <laughs> Uh, the tunnel's not getting bigger and the light getting bigger. It's getting smaller and the light's dimming out. This is the end days. These are the end times. And we need to be more alert, more sober, more vigilant, if I can use that right pronunciation, uh, for God. Satan is real and he's not letting up. He's not going to let up. So why don't men study or love this book? Well, there's six good reasons why they don't. So hopefully it's been a blessing to you. Let's all stand. I, don't, I think that I don't think we're just going to um, we'll just be dismissed. And a lot of times we, we sing, we think we have to have the music we pass on that for tonight. Uh, remember our prayer petition that was been brought up, the people that are sick and uh, battling with cancer, serious cancer. Uh, one gentleman I forgot is my father-in-law, Brother Robert Hoddle. And he is battling with, uh, with his cancer. They did the operation. He's going through the procedures, the chemo, the radiation at one, some point. And then hopefully it moves through. It is an aggressive cancer. But you say, man, oh, yeah, that's how we as humans look at that because that's what we're given. That's what we have. But God looks at us like, yeah, I, that ain't a, that's not a problem. So pray to that end. We pray that God heals these people that are dealing with these sicknesses that sometimes doctors don't have answers for. And you live through. So let's, let's remember them, most importantly. And then the services, the ministries of our church, and those uh, things going on for this, this week. Don't forget our special uh, offering. Pray about that. Put it before God. Say, I don't know what to do with that. I'm a little scared. I'm a hesitant. Let, put it before God. Just like, uh, just like Joshua. Just like Joshua did. Uh, you know, he's going he's gonna to test God. Just like Gideon did. He's going to test God. Moses did. He tests God. Prove God. Prove God. God don't mind. He's not, he's, not, he's not one of those, you know, well, you prove me, you put him out. No, God said, I'll, he said, prove me here. And uh, he's going to give you a blessing. He'll give you a blessing uh, through that giving. In whatever manner, and I'm speaking of your talent, I'm speaking of your treasure, and I'm speaking of your time. So God will take all three. We need all three. All right, hopefully it's been a blessing. We're going to close in prayer. And I'm going to ask Brother Dennis Dove if you would close us in a word of prayer, brother.